Coming up this evening on NTD Business. Russia cuts gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria. Is doubling down on demands to be paid in Russian rubles. Pending home sales fall again in the U.S. for the fifth month in a row. Are prices going to go with them? That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Paul Graney here, live from New York City. Top news today coming from Europe. Russian oil giant Gazprom says it's cutting off gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria. Both countries have refused to pay for Russian gas in Russian rubles. That's what Vladimir Putin demanded. In the Fake Quarter with more. Russia's largest energy company has officially declared it will fully halt gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland. Poland imported around 45% of its gas from Russia in 2020, and gas is 16% of its energy usage. Investments made into the infrastructure have produced diversification possibilities and allow us to feel on the safe side. But Bulgaria, on the other hand, got 73% of its gas from Russia, and gas is 15% of its energy usage. Bulgaria can meet the needs of users for a certain long enough period. During that time, alternative supplies are available and Bulgaria's hopes that alternative routes and supplies will also be secured. This is the first time Russia has shut off gas to countries who refuse to pay in rubles. This is certainly a clear sign that Russia is willing to use gas is a weapon against Europe. Simona Tagliapietra is a senior fellow at Bruegel, a European think tank. Tagliapietra says Europe's high energy prices will likely remain high for a long time. Before the invasion, the EU got around 40 percent of its gas from Russia. Since Russia has the gas that everyone needs, that kind of indicates that they're more in the driver's seat. William Stack is the owner of Stack Financial Services. Stack says not demanding payments in rubles is equal to giving away gas for free because Russia is cut off from its financial reserves. It can't access the currencies it holds in different countries. What Putin wants to achieve is that European countries sell euros and therefore buy rubles. And with that, the euro would weaken and at the same time, the ruble would strengthen. Daniel Lacaye is the author of The Energy World is Flat. Lacaye says some European countries have agreed to pay in rubles. And in May, we'll see how many more will follow. Bay Quarter, NTD News. And back stateside, it looks like rising mortgage rates could be pouring cold water on a red-hot housing market. The National Association of Realtors says contracts to buy previously owned homes fell 1.2% in March. That's five months in a row of declines, driving new contracts to the lowest level in almost two years. Pending home sales are a leading indicator of how healthy the housing market is. And although sales rose in the Northeast, they fell in the South, they fell in the Midwest, and they fell in the West. Compared to a year ago, pending home sales are down 8.2%. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate averaged 5.11% last week. That's the highest level in 12 years. NAR's chief economist said people still want to buy homes, but affordability has become a major limiting factor. And with us live is the president of Coldwell Banker Realties, Coldwell Banker Realties Central West Region, A.U. Rabah. Rabah oversees the daily sales of more than 3,500 real estate professionals. A.U., thank you. Thank you for having me. Fewer home sales, it seems. Are prices going to fall? Well, it- you're absolutely right. You are seeing fewer home sales, according to the data. But, uh, you know, we attribute those fewer home sales due to the lack of inventory that's out there in the marketplace, especially compared to the number of homes that are available today compared to 2019. Less than half the homes available are available today than were available this time in 2019. So affordability, is it a problem? Well, I think as you see the rise in interest rates, um, you know, the first time home buyers are the ones that are going to be impacted the most from an uh, affordability perspective, especially today, as you see home prices increasing and interest rates increasing, that's the group that typically gets impacted the most. As we see that, are your colleagues getting fewer inquiries? You know, I spent a lot of time talking to our real estate agents, and what they are telling us is things have not slowed down from an activity perspective. 
mainly because of, you know, there's so much demand out there and the demand is outpacing supply and people are really fe uh, fearing that they're going to be missing out and that their prices are going to continue to rise. So they're trying to lock in a price today and a monthly payment today. We see some mortgage providers laying off staff because mortgage originations have fallen so much. Are you saying that there's enough cash buyers, et cetera, out there in the market to keep prices high? Well, I, I think that there, you'll, you'll always have the cash buyers out there. And, uh, you know, I, I sense that mortgage originations are declining only because there is a lack of inventory out there uh, for those home buyers to actually go out and purchase. I also believe that some of the uh, some of the impacts on the mortgage industry are driven by the refinancing. So as interest rates go up, you've got less people who are refinancing. So, um, you know, I think that's also impacting the, that industry. So we aren't seeing buyers getting rejected for mortgages as rates start to increase. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't have the data showing how many people are getting rejected on mortgages, but what I am seeing on the street is that there are multiple offers that are continuing to be placed on properties and that the demand has not slowed down a bit yet. How about on the inventory side? Are we going to see more houses come on the market? What's holding people back? Well, I think, you know, if you take a look at a, at a couple or somebody who's trying to sell their home, they're starting to think about, well, where do I move next? And they're probably a little cautious about, you know, getting their home on the market and selling it um, and then not having an alternative uh, for them uh, to, to move into afterwards. I think that's really what's impacting uh, some folks from, uh, from moving. And they're seeing costs go up as well. So if they sell their home at a certain price, although they will have appreciated so much, they're concerned about what they're going to have to pay once they go out and buy. So what do you think breaks that cycle? Well, look, I, 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 I feel that the federal government is trying to slow things down and cool off uh, you know, inflation a, a little bit. Um, I think that will, will cool things off a, a, a little bit, just m my simple prediction. But uh, you know, people still need to live their lives. People will move, there will be reasons why people will move. So I, I don't see a slowdown until we really address the inventory issue. And when you look at housing starts, there simply is not enough housing out there uh, to meet the demand. It's been an incredible rally in home prices. A.U. Brubach, Coldwell Banker, thank you. Thank you. You ready for more doom and gloom? Well, Deutsche Bank says a major recession is on the way. Yippee. The bank is warning about a steep downturn in part because of high inflation. The bank says the Federal Reserve will aggressively raise interest rates to try fight inflation, but that could slow down and hurt the economy. Consumer prices spiked, to eight, spiked by 8.5% in March, the fastest rise in 40 years. The job market, though, is still hot. The bank sees the economy rebounding, though, by mid-2024. The bank says the biggest risk, though, is that inflation will remain persistently elevated for longer than generally anticipated. Remember, transitory. Other financial institutions, though, like Goldman Sachs, say a recession is not inevitable. It's a good one. And a new study from investment firm Charles Schwab shows the younger generation is already stashing away cash in their mid-20s. It also shows millennials have more money in their 401ks than the generation before them did at the same age. The reason in part, they don't expect to get pension plans. In 1981, 84% of full-time workers at large companies had pensions. By 2020, that number had dropped to 28%. Millennials are worse off in nearly all aspects of their financial well-being. They graduated into the Great Recession, dealt with the pandemic and the second recession, now they're gearing up for what financial analysts predict will be another recession paired with high levels of inflation. There is one thing millennials are focused on, cryptocurrency. A quarter of them plan to invest in digital currencies compared with about 5% of baby boomers. It looks like the city of Fort Worth, Texas is getting in on that sentiment. It's becoming the first city government in the United States to mine Bitcoin. Bitcoin mining is using powerful computers to maintain the ledger of who owns what Bitcoin. You can also get paid a small, small amount of Bitcoin for helping keeping the ledger up to date. 
The city, starting out small with only three mining rigs, which were donated, but they'll run 24-7 out of City Hall. The mayor of the city's first millennial mayor says they estimate each machine will take up as much power as a regular vacuum cleaner, although at least one expert says they'll take up more power over time. The city doesn't expect the miners to make a lot of money, but the mayor says she believes they could put Fort Worth on the map and rebrand the city as a place of tech innovation. The city will try it out for six months and then decide whether to invest real cash into building a Bitcoin mine. Bitcoin mining, of course, has been criticized for using too much electricity. Now lawmakers in New York are one step closer to banning Bitcoin mining that doesn't use renewable energy. Anthony's Phil Zo has the story. The New York State Assembly just passed a bill that would ban all new Bitcoin mining centers that don't use renewable energy. If you use any energy that, that's not renewable, you won't be able to start a, a mining operation in New York. Grant McCarthy is executive director at the Bitcoin Advocacy Project. This is a problem because it's an example of the government trying to pick winners in a very young, nascent industry. Uh, they're essentially saying we like one kind of mining, we like one kind of cryptocurrency, and we don't like another. The bill would hold back new Bitcoin mining centers that use carbon energy and also freeze current mining centers from expanding or growing for two years. I think uh, hindering innovation and any sort of new innovating industry is uh, a bad thing to do. Ryan Brienza has been involved with crypto mining since high school. Today, he manages several Bitcoin mining centers at Zafra LLC, with locations in Illinois and upstate New York. I do think it'll hinder growth. Um, it'll definitely take away from jobs. There's a lot of electrical jobs um, created by this business, uh, especially a lot of stuff in the build-out uh, phases of any of these operations. Brienza knows this all too well, as his town, Plattsburgh, New York was the first U.S. city to ban crypto mining back in 2018. But we weren't able to expand upon our operation or anybody else looking to come to the area wasn't able to come because they wouldn't have gotten approved to do so. The bill still has to be reviewed and voted on by the state Senate and then signed by the New York governor in order to become law. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. So with Bitcoin becoming more mainstream, there's a new capital fund dedicated to financing the build-out of the Bitcoin ecosystem. The Ego Death Capital Fund is founded by serial entrepreneur Jeff Booth, a former VP of trading at Goldman Sachs and another finance expert. Crypto expert Lynn Alden will be advising the fund. She's the founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Asked her if the Bitcoin ecosystem is a friend or a competitor to the digital currency systems being developed by the world's central banks. Well, there are scenarios where they can they can coexist, right? But uh, basically, you know, Bitcoin is this kind of trustless system, uh, open network, uh, and so it's naturally kind of an opposition to uh, entities that want to have a very closed network. And so it, it partially depends on the design of those, uh, you know, kind of other types of currencies. And so I would describe it as basically somewhat of a threat towards authoritarian types of regimes, uh, but something that, that more democratic countries are able to, to work with and, and use uh, if they're smart about how they want to regulate it and how they want to incorporate it. So looking at the, the plans in America or in Europe so far, you think they are developing their systems to integrate something like Bitcoin? I think over time we're seeing uh, basically more acceptance in the financial industry, right? So initially there was pushback, uh, but now we're starting to see, for example, that that banks are working with with firms like NYDIG and, and others to allow people to you know buy Bitcoin through their bank account. We're also seeing large investment banks getting in the space. We see insurance companies owning very small amounts of Bitcoin, at least for, you know as a percentage of their assets. You know the number's over a billion dollars worth uh, on their balance sheet. Uh, pension starting to dabble in it. Fidelity just announced that they're going to bring Bitcoin into 401k plans. So one of the largest uh, 401k providers, uh, you know, basically will provide that access. And so I think it's slowly being integrated into more and more pools of capital. And that, that's so far been mostly a private sector decision. Uh, and any sort of government regulation uh, can provide clarity and can give more green light for, for cap, you know, pools of capital to know to what extent they can do it, how they can do it as well as, you know, maybe certain types of cryptocurrencies that they can't do it with, because not all cryptocurrencies are created equally. Why is it becoming more accepted? Well, so part of it is just the, the size and the length of the network, 
network, right? So when, when Bitcoin was under $10 billion and it was a couple years old, uh, it was very volatile. Uh, it was poorly understood. Uh, whereas now it's been in, in you know, working uh, with, you know, for 13 years, it's had 100% uptime since 2013. Uh, which is actually a higher uptime than the Fedwire system, ironically. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's reached over a trillion dollar market cap. It's pulled back somewhat, but that's normal as part of the cycle. And so now it's a large enough and durable enough asset class that, that you know, bigger pools of capital can at least begin dabbling in around the margins. Of course, it has a finite supply. Is this why you're primarily so bullish on it? I think there are a number of factors. One is the finite supply uh, relative to uh, to the infinite uh, potential supply of, of you know, any other uh, currency. Uh, but then there's also the fact that it's, you know, it, basically it's a decentralized transfer agent and registrar. It, you know, it's, 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 it's decentralized, uh, you know, kind of permissionless system, which opens up all sorts of avenues for programmable money uh, and kind of, uh, you know, more efficient global transfers of value. And so it's, it's both the network that's attractive as well as the, the units on the network that are attractive. Where does the new ego death fund come in? Well, there's still a lot of things to be built on top of Bitcoin, right? So there's, you know, there's ways to store your Bitcoin, custody Bitcoin, uh, and then there's a whole host of layer two uh, uh, protocols being built on, on top of Bitcoin, right? And so many of these are open source. Uh, you have things like the, the Lightning Network, for example. You have other types of scaling solutions, uh, and the, you know, a lot of these, the, you know, even though Bitcoin itself is not a company, there are companies that are deploying tech uh, and basically tapping into this open monetary network. And so just like any other growth industry, there is VC capital in the space. And, and so I'll be advising EgoDeath Capital about, you know, how to, you know, help deploy their capital and what types of investments, uh, you know, are looking attractive or which, what, what some of the risks might be and how the macro environment can kind of, you know, conflict or help with some of these types of, of solutions. Got about 20 seconds. What do you, what practical application are you most excited about? I think the biggest thing is probably that, you know, for, for those of us in developed markets, we take this for granted, but, you know, something like 50% of the world lives in authoritarian regimes. Uh, a billion people have, you know, uh, massive inflation. Uh, in, in their, you know, their past generation. And so this basically gives the whole world kind of access to this same technology. Lynn Alden, Lynn Alden Investments, try to appreciate it. Good luck with the new fund. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Now that Twitter has accepted Elon Musk's offer, will the Chinese Communist Party gain influence over Twitter through Musk? And did Don Ma? There are definitely arguments for both sides. Those who say Beijing may gain influence over Twitter point to Musk's Tesla business in China. China is one of the biggest markets for Tesla. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos raised the question on Twitter, did the Chinese government just gain a bit of leverage over the town square? The town square being Twitter. And Nat Alon Beck, professor of law at Case Western Reserve University, says there are definitely concerns. Well, I think he's definitely in a spot where he has a conflict of interest. I think he's very vulnerable. Whether, it's he, whether he's compromised or not, time will tell. But we do know that he has a lot of skin in the game, as we say, in, in China. But China expert David Zhang argues that Musk's businesses in China won't affect Twitter. I think the Twitter issue and the his China business is two separate issues that's essentially being conflated into one. I think his Twitter acquisition is a real opportunity for him to show that he is for free speech. When it's a free speech platform, you're going up against the very core of the principles of communism, which is censorship, which is not allowing people to talk. Does the fact that Musk seems to be going against the core principles of communism mean that he won't let Beijing influence Twitter? Alan Beck suggests we wait and see. I'm not only going to take a look at his words. Let's take a look at his actions, and time will tell. Let's take a look at his actions and see. I think that actions speak louder than words. Jeff Bezos has since walked back on his question on whether Musk's Twitter will be influenced by China. He wrote on Twitter, My own answer to this question is probably not. The more likely outcome in this regard is complexity in China for Tesla rather than censorship at Twitter. Musk is extremely good at navigating this kind of complexity. Don Ma, NTD News. Like a Wall Street market, it's a little flat today. The Dow and S&P did rebound from yesterday's steep sell-off, though. 
The Dow was up 62 points, two tenths of a percent. S&P gained nine points, two and two tenths or two tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq lost just two points today. Microsoft up nearly 5% after a strong report late yesterday. Meta also rallied after the bell after beating earnings estimates today. But Google parent Alphabet shares fell almost 4% today. Didn't do too well in the first quarter. Its revenues were higher than in the same quarter last year, but higher expenses led to a drop in profit. It also missed analyst expectations, especially with YouTube. While it made more money off YouTube ads this quarter in comparison with the same quarter last year, Analysts expected much better, $7.5 billion in revenue ahead of the far lower $6.8 billion. How much weight do we put on analyst expectations? Up for debate. With Google's stock sliding down, it announced a $70 billion share buyback, something companies usually do when they think they're undervalued. And retail trading platform Robinhood says it's laying off about 9% of its workforce. The company says the rapid headcount growth led to some duplicate roles and job functions. As of late December, it had 3,800 employees. It announced the layoffs yesterday, causing shares to fall to the lowest price since the company went public last summer. Shares are down about 48% so far this year. Robinhood CEO said the company will introduce key new products this year across brokerage, crypto and saving and investing. It will report quarterly results later this week. Still to come, stay with us. Billionaire Warren Buffett is hosting his final lunch for a San Francisco charity. And robots in Italy make marble sculptures using a special type of software in a fraction of the time it takes humans. That and more coming up on NTD Business. China before communism. Behold, a splendid culture reborn, filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions. Live on stage. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, promoting martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The 2022 NTD International Traditional Chinese Martial Arts Competition Preliminaries will be held in New York and Taiwan. On August 28th, the finals will be broadcast live online worldwide. Registration hotline 188-477-9228. For more information, please visit martialarts.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. Billionaire Warren Buffett is going to hold his 21st and final charity lunch to raise money for a San Francisco nonprofit. The nonprofit's called Glide. It helps the poor, the homeless, and people battling substance abuse. The auction begins on June 12th on eBay and will last six days. The winner and as many as seven guests will dine with Buffett at a steakhouse in Manhattan. 
Buffett has raised more than $38, $34 million for Glide through lunch auctions that began in 2000. Buffett, did you know, is also giving away most of his wealth, including over $40 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and four family charities. And Walmart is boosting its members' fuel discount to compete with other retailers. Starting today, Walmart Plus subscribers get 10 cents off a gallon of gas at participating fuel stations. Previously, it only offered a discount of 5 cents a gallon to Walmart Plus subscribers. Now it's doubling the discount and adding 12,000 Exxon and mobile stations across the United States. Walmart Plus is a $98 a year subscription plan competing with Amazon Prime. On top of fuel discounts, members get free shipping on most items and the ability to scan items with an app in physical stores and pay without waiting in a checkout line. (laughs) And a company in Italy has developed robots that can make marble statues using sophisticated software. The works once might have taken a sculptor years to complete, but the robot can finish them in just a few days. Let's take a look. Italian company Robotor has come up with a new type of robot named Bot1, which can precision sculpt works of art. It took the team years to develop the software that controls the robot's movements, but not everyone is convinced that this is the right way forward. One of them is the president of the Cooperative of Sculptors of Carrara in Italy. A sculpture refined by a robot is a dead sculpture, but when refined by an artisan, as far as I'm concerned, is a live sculpture, a fresh sculpture, a real sculpture. For me, a sculpture cannot be made by a robot because it has to be done by hand. It is something which has to be done together by the artisan and the artist. There has to be this symbiosis. The artist who puts in the art and the inspiration and the marble artisan who produces with his hands the work which the artist has entrusted him to make. The team members behind the robot defend their creation. They say the robot doesn't steal people's jobs because it requires humans to operate. One of the co-founders of the company also says such robots have great potential. This because it helps artisans in their physical efforts, allowing them to specialize in the finishing touches, which are what makes the difference, as well as making them competitive in the market, which is extremely demanding in terms of production and timing and exhibitions. So those who want to remain in the world of production of contemporary art have to equip themselves with the necessary technological instruments. A professor of robotics at Sapienza University of Rome says robots are moving out of the factories and are increasingly used in the art world. He says what is new is the symbiosis between artists and technology from block of marble to finished sculpture. It's not new, but what is new is the integration between uh, uh, the, the whole of the whole process. So from the design of the object, which can be made uh, on the computer with CAD tools, to the programming of the robot, to the choice of the tools, the proper tools for doing the operation, until the supervisory part, which is still there from artists that completes the job. The team that created the robot plans to enable precision sculpture of not only marble, but also of plastic and wood. They arrange the production of statues commissioned by some of the world's leading artists, and also replicate archaeological pieces or statues which have been damaged or destroyed. That's the latest from the NTD business team. I'm myself, Paul Graney. But you can still catch NTD Evening News. That's with Stephanie Cox at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Follow me on Twitter, too, if you're there. For NTD Business, that's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.